this week's announcements. Have a great week and God bless you. It is so good to see everyone on this beautiful day. Hello, my name is, uh, in case I didn't introduce myself yet, my name is Eric Bucci, and I'm the lead pastor here at Cornerstone Church, and I also want to welcome everyone that's watching us online, wherever you're located. I just want to let you know something, how much God loves each and every one of you. Each and every one of you are important to God. He sees you, he knows you, he knows your hurts, he knows your hopes, he knows your dreams, and our objective is that you would come to know him more, and I pray that today that would be the case in Jesus' name. Can you guys do me a big, big favor? Can you welcome everyone that's watching online, and welcome yourself, nice and loud, come Come on, you're better than that. Amen. Hey, uh, just a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, if you guys could do us a big favor, we our parking lot is not really uh, adequate, unfortunately. And so uh, things get a little tight sometimes, the second service. And so if you want to come to the first or the third, that would help us a little bit. We also have the cornerstone squeeze where we kind of move in closer to each other. You can also do that uh, to help us uh, to make sure everyone can get set and ready. And that's good. it's a good challenge to have, and uh, we had these challenges prior to that situation that came our way that affected the world for nearly two years, but I'm not going to mention it because I'm tired of talking about it. I want to move on. How about you? Yeah. Okay, so uh, that, that's what's going on with that. Today at 1 o'clock, we have Grove Track Step 1. We talk about what Cornerstone Church, what we believe is a church, our history, our philosophy of ministry, and if you'd like to, you become a member, or you can just find out what we're about and kind of tick, kick the tires uh, before you would want to commit to being a part of this church. That's at 1 o'clock today. We have child care and a full meal, a good meal too. So that's today at 1 o'clock, and I'll be sharing uh, the, the story of the church. We get you in and out less than an hour by two minutes, and uh, you'll have your lunch, and you'll walk out completely satisfied. It's raining anyhow today, so why not? All right. So today we're talking about it's complicated. We're going to one more one more week we're going to have about complication. And next week we're going to learn how to have a good marriage. How many of you like to change your spouse? No, 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 not change your spouse, but change your spouse. How many want to have a better marriage? How many want to find a spouse? Right? We're going to talk next week how to make find your spouse. The way you're so happy with your spouse. And I guarantee everyone can be. And that's next week, but you're going to have to wait till next week. But today, we're talking about it's complicated, and we're going to talk about something called conflict. How many of you like conflict? When things don't go correctly, right? I heard of a story a number of years ago that there was this man that had this boulder in the front yard, and his teacher was telling him, a young man, he says, I want to move that boulder. So, well, if you want to move it, you're going to have to push the boulder. I can't push that boulder. Yes, you need to. I want you to push it 20 minutes a day, three times a day. And so that's what he did. For 20 minutes, three times a day, he'd go out there and push every day and every day and every day. At first, he was kind of weak. He couldn't really get it. He was kind of a wimpy white guy. By the end, he looked like your pastor. And <laughs> that's me, by the way. I took it yesterday. Anyhow, I'm lying. I'm going to get struck by lightning. But anyhow, so what he did is that conflict, he kept pushing it and pushing it and pushing it. And that conflict grew him. A couple of weeks ago, or three weeks ago, I took my son uh, I'm gonna, one of my sons, I don't want to embarrass him, the one that's 17, but I'm not going <laughs> to. And we went to the gym, and, and, and I used to go to the gym, and I used to work out. And I'm just trying, showing my son how to build strength and coordination, and I'm work sitting there, and I overdid it a little bit. And, uh, and I started doing this, and you know, doing curls and, and bench presses. You know, this is what guys like bench presses. What do you bench, you know? And so we always exaggerate when we talk about that. So I was doing all this stuff, and, and so what happens is there's conflict. In order to build muscle, you need conflict. In order to grow, you need conflict. Without conflict, we don't grow. And so you go to the gym, there's conflict. i got to rift this up. Once it's no longer conflict, i got to put more weight on it so I have more conflict. So conflict's a part of life. And so incidentally, uh, I did too much. And I don't know if you noticed a couple of weeks ago, I looked like a T-Rex. I was like this. 
I couldn't bend my arms. I literally, before I came out here, I was like, ah! I'm like, my, you know, I overdid the curls, and I wasn't used to it. And so sometimes when we hit conflict, we cry about it. We're like, God must hate me because you're in so much pain because of the conflict. But if you will allow God to move and work through that conflict, it can grow you to be a stronger person. You see, love plus con- conflict equals growth. Love plus con- conflict equals growth. And that's what God wants to do to you and me. Now, conflict's a part of life. In fact, Jesus gives us a promise. He says to his disciples, I hope you're one of his disciples, it is impossible. When Jesus says something is impossible, it is? Thank you. Jesus said to his disciples, it is impossible that no offenses should come. You are going to be offended by somebody. In fact, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if I've offended you already. And if I have not offended you yet, please give me an opportunity. I promise you, one of these days, I will offend you. Not on purpose, maybe. So anyhow, you can't help it. Every time you get people together, there's going to be conflict. There's going to be friction, no matter who you are. Why? Because you and I are different than each other. And conflict can either be your friend or your foe. And so God wants to grow us. He said it's impossible that no offenses should come. So you're going to be offended. So why don't you go ahead and make your mind up ahead of time. I'm going to be offended today, and I'm okay with that. Okay, this is not heaven. You will be offended, and I will be offended. I was offended last night when I went to the gas station. It went up at $1.20 in one day. I was really offended. I only filled it up halfway for the same price for full. But I'm not complaining. Hmm. (laughs) Conflict plus love equals growth. Let me say it this way. Conflict plus the love of God equals growth. You can either get better or you can get bitter. I don't know about you, but I want to grow in this set of circumstances. I hope that in the last couple of years, that C word that came our way, not conflict, the other one, okay, that ends with a C and ends with a D, I pray to help us to make us stronger. I hope that we grew from it, that this conflict that we have, and in any relationship, you will have conflict whether you like it or not. What are we to do about it? I'm in a relationship and it's complicated. That's a whole series. Every time your relationship is complicated, guess what's not far behind? Starts with an S. S and it ends with an N. And the middle letter is an I. What does it say? Sin. That's right. When, you, when, when relationships are complicated, sin is involved. Sin means missing the mark. Complicated. When I, when I say complicated, I mean like, oh, it, it doesn't give you peace at all. In fact, the Bible even talks about this, and I, we talk about this. Sin complicates your life. God's ways simplify your life. Okay? Now, sin is in- exceedingly easy, and it complicates your life. Following Jesus can be difficult, but it simplifies your life. And when it's simple, it means everything works the way it's supposed to work. God is not a complicated God. He's profound. He blows your mind, but he's not complicated in the way like, oh, what? It, it doesn't make sense. It's chaos. There's no chaos in God. Some of you believe you came from glue, were in the zoo, and now you're you. No, we don't believe that. We believe God is a God of design. We believe God created the heavens and the earth. We believe that everything there is, there's order. If you study science and you look into science, there's order. There's no such thing as disorder. Everything works together. What's disorderly is our minds can't figure out God's order. So God is full of of truth. He does not complicate. He simplifies our life. In fact, I'll say it this way. Jesus makes life extremely simple. He does. He tells us to do two things. If you and I would do two things, everything in our life would change radically. Our relationships would change. Our money situations would change. Our health would change. And let me tell you, our world would change. You know what it is? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. All the law of the the prophets are on that. In fact, a Pharisee said, I was reading the other day in the one-year Bible that we're reading through, he said, he said, well, all the law, the prophets are done. It's more important than all the sacrifices. And Jesus says, you're not far from the kingdom. 
You see, you can, you can lay hands on the sick and they can recover. You can walk on water. You can go to the Long Island Sound and walk, to, walk from Connecticut to Long Island. And you may walk in all the spiritual wonders and signs and wonders. You know what? It means nothing if you don't love God and love each other. Am I saying that the signs and wonders are not important? No. But compare to loving God and treating each other one you want to, the way you want to be treated, who cares about the rest? And that's what Jesus says. So is that not simple? I mean, you can ask yourself the question, am I, am I loving God in this situation? Am I loving my neighbors myself? That, I mean, so we can all go home now. We're done. No, stay. Okay. Jesus makes life extremely simple. Now, we're going to ask ourselves the question. Conflict's going to happen, all right? What causes the conflict? What causes the trouble that you and I have? What causes the problem in marriage? What causes the problem in relationships? What causes the problems in church between employees and employees and employers? What causes conflict between countries? Well, right here it tells us. What causes quarrels? Here we go. And what causes fights among you? You want to know, everybody? Here we go. Is it not that this, that your passions are at war within you? Uh, I think right now there's a guy right now in Russia who has a lot of passion to bring the motherland of Russia back, back to the days of the czars and the Soviet Union, and he's got passions. I want to have. I want to be powerful, right? And you do the same thing. Maybe we don't have countries, but I want to have my way. I want to watch what I want to watch. I want to do what I want to do. Don't you tell me what to do. I am an American. I can do whatever I want to do, right? What causes your quarrels is that your passions are at war within you. And what's the war? You want to know what the war is? This is the war for Vladimir Putin, and this is the war for you on the way to church this morning for some of you. Have. Now, how can I say that? Because invariably, how many know what I'm talking about? Coming to church can be a war. Am I the only one that ever happened to growing up? With the kids screaming and everything like that? Okay, you guys are just more spiritual than the rest of us. So the first service kind of knew it, but you guys are more spiritual. So is it not your passions that are at war within you? You desire and do not have. All right, now we, we talked about this already. We talked about it several weeks ago. What's the first word babies say? Mine, right? And they say it with a blood-curdling uh, volume that would just melt your ears. Mine. And they are completely content until another boy or girl's in the corner of the nursery pulls out a shiny toy. All of a sudden, the entire room has to have that. And it happens today with us as adults. The problem is, that's kind of cute, sort of. From my understanding, I, I hear that being a grandparent is fantastic. You enjoy all that, and then as soon as they do that, you hand them back. I, have, I don't have that luxury at this point. Maybe one of these days when I'm many years from now. Okay. You desire and do not have, so you murder. Right? I want to have Ukraine. I'm going to murder people. I, I want this. I'm going to murder you. I'm going to, I'm going to maybe not murder you physically, but I'm going to murder your reputation. I'm going to knock you down so I can get that promotion. I, I'm going to make that little, that met that girl who thinks she's so popular in school. Yeah, you, you should see what she does. Oh, and she's so fake. I'll show you what she's really like. And I want to be more popular than this person. And I desire, I'll, I'll just, let me tell you what she's really like. Let me tell you why well, that church is growing across the street after all. They're not preaching the Bible. And all that kind of stuff we do. We try to murder each other with our words. And maybe we don't murder, but the same process is there. Uh, you desire, do not have, so you murder. You covet, and that's part of the Ten Commandments, right? Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor. You, should, you, can, you covet, I want what you have. I want to have well-behaving be, be, children. I want to be in that college. I, I, I want to have that job. I want to be like you. I want to be skinny and wear nice clothes like you. I want to have this, this type of church that you have. And what we do, you covet and cannot obtain. So you fight and you quarrel. This is what happens in a marriage. Do you know, I, there's something I learned from Jimmy Evans. I heard him say a number of years ago. Great marriage guy. Um, marriage on the rock. This is what he says. Most of our problems in our marriages have two words to solve them. You know what they are? Grow up. We're selfish. You have to, and I'm not, I'm not selfish. Yeah, you are. How can you say it? I just said it, and you are selfish. If you don't think you're selfish, you really are selfish. Because you're selfish, you don't even realize you're selfish. Okay, think about that for a few moments. We'll move on. You can covet and cannot obtain, so you fight in a quarrel. You do not have, 
Because you do not ask. Ask who? You ask God. Where does every good and perfect gift come from? God. Where do all blessings come from? God. So God is my source, not somebody else. You see, you and I, I compare to each other all the time. It will drive you crazy. So love overlooks the wrongs that others do. The law doesn't. See, you and I, let me just stop you for a moment and mention something. We like to compare ourselves to other people. That causes perhaps more trouble than anything else in our lives, is comparing what you have compared to what I have. Either I get conceited and think I'm better, or I feel I'm less than, and I have to knock you down to get what you have. And it even happens with the disciples. They compare each other. Who's the better disciple? And what you and I need to do is become witty. In the end of the book of John, uh, Peter was there being restored by Jesus before Jesus went into heaven. And Jesus told uh, Peter, hey, Peter, when you were young, you went where you wanted to go. But when you get older, you're going to be taken where you do not want to go, indicating the type of death he would have. And then Peter, like a good Christian, like an apostle of the faith, said, what about that man? What is that to you? That's witty. What is that to you? You follow me. Whether he remains or not, that's not your problem. You follow me. The problem that you and I have is not that we care about our brother and sister so they do well, but we care because we compare. We care because we compare. And nothing comes good at a comparison. It causes untold suffering. I'm telling you, it causes untold suffering. Stop comparing. You follow God. You ask God what you want. The Bible says you have not because you ask not. And when you ask, you ask with the wrong motives that you would spend it on your own pleasures. So I got to ask God, God, I'm asking for this situation and ask God, is my heart right? Is my mind right? Are my motivations correctly? Are correct, excuse me. Is my motivation correct? And put it through the guise and, and put it through the the equation of heaven. God, I need this. Why do I need this? Because everyone else has it. Do you, I hope you're following me, everybody. This is what happens. You have not because you ask not. And when you do ask, and I ask, we ask with wrong motivations. And I don't think there's ever been a time in human history where more comparisons take place through this lovely device. Since 2007, the world has changed. When that iPhone came out, I mean, it's wonderful, but we compare, we compare, we compare, we compare. You know what I'm talking about, everybody. We're constantly comparing ourselves. And you are so depressed when you look at other people because you can't measure up after they spent eight hours trying to find a selfie that works. Okay? You do not have because you do not ask. So love overlooks the wrongs that others do because you realize how much God loves you. Now, how do we deal with this situation today? Okay? Proverbs says this in 20, Proverbs 20, verse 3. How do you handle conflict? Here it goes. Avoiding a fight is a mark of honor. Only fools insist on quarreling. Sometimes the best thing to do is to up. Okay, that's it. All I'm going to say. Just up and put the first part there. All right. A fool is quick-tempered, but a wise person stays calm when insulted. Now, for all you introvert people... You may not yell out loud. What's going on? Oh, I'm fine. <laughs> Praise the Lord. How do you, you know, you know, how do you know you have issues? If someone cuts you off in traffic and you want to kill them, you probably have issues. <laughs> if your computer doesn't work and you want to throw the computer out of the window, you have something else going on in your life. Pent up anger and rage. And so a fool is quick tempered. But a wise person stays calm. And what happens is the cerebral cortex, the frontal lobes of the mind where their logic, what happens is we give in to what God made us. He gave us these defense mechanisms. Adrenaline pumps into your mind, a fight or flight. And next thing you know, you're, you're, you're in the other part of the brain that doesn't even think. And all the blood goes from that to the other. The best thing to do, this is scientific. This is, this is how God made us. Walk away until your reason comes back. Don't listen to your emotions. Your emotions will lie to you. Walk on the truth. That's just something for someone to do. That's for free, by the way. You may say thank you. Okay. Fool is quick tamper, but a wise person stays calm when insulted. Now, what are some steps we must follow when someone wrongs you? Now, there's a reason, there's a reason why this is capitalized. I learned this the hard way. Uh, several years ago, I texted somebody, and I made the mistake of putting all caps. And they were infuriated with me. Why are you yelling at me? I said, I just sent you a text. 
How can I yell during a text? Will you capitalize on? So today, I'm yelling at you in a quiet way. Steps we, what? Must follow when someone wrongs you, when you get conflicted, when someone offends you. It's gonna happen. What do we do? I'm so glad the Bible tells us what to do. Here we go. We're gonna go through some steps here. This might be parochial for some of you, but if we did this, we would solve, probably 95% of most of our problems would be solved if we did this. I'm not kidding you. You know what they say about statistics. You make them up on, on the fly. 38% of what you make, okay. If your brother sins against you, go on Facebook or Instagram. And, and, and don't say their name, but make it so obvious that everyone who knows you and that person will figure it out. Oh, you know, the guy that has the blonde hair and lives on Birch Drive in Cheshire. About five foot, about six foot three. Has a V body. Has a 28 waist, 52 chest. Okay. But if your brother sins, there's a reason I wear this jacket to stop people from being tempted. There's a reason why. If your brother sins against you, go and what? Tell him. Tell Tell her. Tell him. Don't tell somebody else. Yeah, but there's no human resources there. I got to tell somebody, and I want you to pray for that person. You know what you're being there? I'm going to call it, I'm going to say, if you go tell somebody else, guess what you are? You guess what you're acting like? A loser. I just said it. That's right. Because you're not going to win in the kingdom of heaven. When you start talking about other people without the other person being there, you're being a loser. Now, I'm not saying you are a loser, but you're being a loser at that moment. How can you say that? Because I can't tell you how much it will make you lose in life. It will make the church lose. It will make your family lose. And this happens. Come on, make no mistake about it. You know what happens to families. Uh, did you hear what happened to your brother? What? Well, da, 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 da. So now, but don't tell him I told you. So now you have this horrible thing, and now you hear about what's going on, and then you tell your other brother or sister, and now the whole, the whole family knows about it, and you go to Thanksgiving, and it's awkward, right? And then and we talk behind, and this happens in churches, by the way. This happens among staff. He just left. Good, let me tell you what's happening. But we're not, we're just, we're, we're just, you know, it's important that we talk about this. You're being a loser. I've been a loser too. That's being a loser. Do you want to be a loser? I don't want to lose. I want to win in Christ. Don't be a loser. Look at your neighbor and say, don't be a loser. <laughs> if your brother sins against you, go tell him his fault between you and him. At Notice, what does it say? Alone. Alone. Now, this is, comes from Butchie 317. Can I quote you on that? So when someone comes up to you, did you hear what happened to, I'm going to use, um, I'm going to use uh, Allie, my, my friend in the back. Did you hear what happened to Allie? Someone comes up to me. What? Well, you know how Allie is. It's, I stop right there. Stop. Uh, can I quote you on that? What do you mean? Well, I'm going to quote you that you said that about Allie. Oh, no, no, you don't do that. Well, I don't want to hear it then. So, I want to do a little exercise with you today. I'm going to say something about Allie. And I want you to say back to me, Allie, just raise your hand. Everyone knows who you are. Come on, look at Allie in the back. He's awesome. Come on. All right. Did you guys hear about Allie? Okay. This is so parochial. No, I want you to remember this. Can I tell you what happened to Allie? Okay, one more time. Can I tell you what happened to Sandra? No, come on, together now. Okay, now, when someone comes up to you and wants to tell you something about somebody, just between you and me, say this. Now, that will stop them in their tracks. How do you like that one? Bucci 317, you can quote it. Amen. Amen, I have my own Bible. Praise the Lord. It's real thin. (laughs) Real easy. Can I quote you on that? We need to take personal responsibilities. Don't be a loser. I'm just telling it like it is. This will make you lose. 
This brings abuse. And God just folds his arms and goes, I, I, I want to bless them, but we need to move forward. Now, there is this conspiracy going on. There's this group of people. We don't know who they are. But people say all the time now, they go, you know what? They say, I don't know who they are, but they're amazing because they have the answer to everything. And so anytime you hear something, you just say, you know what they say. And I said, I don't know what they say. Where did you get they from? Who is they? You see, I went to university. I have a master's degree. And the only reason I got there, because I had to provide a bibliography. A bibliography is a sources of where you get your information from. I just can't write a paper and talk about what this means and hand it in. And then the professor goes, well, where's the bibliography? Well, you know what they say. He goes, this is what I say. You have an F. The greatest thing I learned in education is I don't know a lot. And I had to verify what I quote. Don't just say something because you read a headline. Just this morning I read a headline. I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. Then I read the body of the article and it said nothing what the headline said. But if all you do is read the headlines and listen to people, you know what they say. No, stop saying you know what they say. If you can't quote it, be quiet. There's this group and there's something about they say. When you say they say, it gives you an opportunity to put your spin on it. What well, you know what they say about that? And then you put your little opinion on you, and you, and you blame they. And it's so amazing because you can't find who they are. It's a consp you want to talk about a conspiracy? This is a conspiracy. They. Stop using they. Quantify. Qualify what you say. Don't just hear something. Check the sources of where you go. Just because some dude has a stethoscope around his neck on YouTube doesn't mean it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Just because someone heard something, I heard a doctor say. There's a lot of doctors out there that are not even doctors. Just because we know what the Bible says, we'll quote it for crying out loud. Find it. Verify, don't vilify. Verify, don't vilify. Stop saying they say. Is that clear? Okay. Find it. Work. I'm just, this, is like, this is like college 101. Writing a research paper 101. You need to find out what you're talking about. People give me news articles. It says ABC Go. I never heard of that before, but it had the same thing as ABC News, and it was a bogus story. Crazy story about pedophiles in the government. I mean, it's insane. I'm like, what are you kidding me? Where'd you get this from? Or oh, it's in the article. That's stupid. Verify. 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 Find good sources. Why am I being so passionate? Because there's a lot of lies circulating around every. You need to make sure what you're saying has been backed up. Because a lot of people say a lot of things. I used this example before. I'll, I'll use it again. I heard of a pastor friend that he was preaching at a, uh, a youth convention and he was preaching his heart out and there was this youth leader in the back that was just, had no decency was talking and you could hear him talking. Believe me, when you're up here and you're trying to talk and you're, it's really annoying. And I may smile and say, bless you, Lord. And meanwhile, I'm going to go inside, Lord, take him down. Anyhow, so, <laughs> so anyhow, this guy's really irate and he tried to see him and he, he couldn't get to him in time. He says, I'm going <clears> to, <throat> tomorrow. So he gets up the following morning, rushes down to the mess hall, whatever you want to call it. It usually is a mess hall. He wants to get his coffee and someone says, did you hear what happened to Jack? What happened to Jack? Well, his parents were in an automobile accident. They're in intensive care. They're almost dying. It's like, oh, my Lord, I didn't know what was going on. Don't vilify. Verify first what's going on. Don't assume you know everything. You're not God. Neither am I. Is that clear, everybody? I hope we understand this. Amen. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and them alone. Most of the problems will be solved right here if you take responsibility. Now, what did I say already? Did you hear what happened to Allie? One more time. Okay, I want you to make that part of your vernacular. That will stop people in their tracks. Okay, I, I'm starting to use it. And you can use it on me, by the way. Sort of. Okay. You and him alone. If he listens to you, which is a phenomenal thing, you have gained your brother back. Okay, now what happens? He doesn't listen or she doesn't listen. But if he or she does not listen... Take one or two other, others along with you that every charge may be verified. That means established. By the what? Evidence. Evidence. E 
by they say. No, evidence. You need evidence of two or three witnesses. Go to the person. They don't listen. Take two or three with you that are credible. What happens after that? If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. Go to the church leadership, all right? And if he refuses to listen, even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile or tax collector. In other words, say, you know what, brother or sister? I love you in the Lord. I'm praying that you come back to God, but I can no longer have fellowship with you. I am not gonna, I'm not, you can call me, you can come to church, but you're not gonna get involved. In fact, in fact, if you continue to do this, I'm gonna ask you to leave. I am disassociating myself with you. I love you and I'm praying for you, but what you're doing is wrong. What would happen if we would do that? In fact, the Bible says this. What does God hate? God doesn't, we should not, never hate. You know, God hates. You want to know what he hates? Here we go. There are six things that the Lord hates. Seven, in other words, the last one, that are an abomination to him. That means this, he's off the charts. We're talking going nuclear, okay? He hates stuff, but this just drives him nuclear. What is it? There's seven, six things. Okay, there are abomination in eight. And here's the last one. This is the one he hates, an abomination. A false witness who breathes out lies. That's one. And one who what? Sows discord, disunity, causes the church to fracture, causes our family to fracture, causes our marriage to fracture. God hates it. Why? He loves his body, and this is a cancer. It will break you apart. It will break apart a family and a church. One who sows discord among brothers. Now, in Titus, this is what Titus says. Uh, Apostle Paul talks to Titus, excuse me, about what we are to do with people that are divisive. Okay? We don't do this often in the church. We need to. As for a person who stirs up division, Jesus says, let them be one as we are one, that the world would know that I was sent. So if we're not one, how's the world going to know that Jesus was sent? You see how important that is? It's important that we're one in the gospel. So the word of God says this. Warn a divisive person. Uh, as for a person who stirs up division, after warning him once and then twice, have what? Nothing more to do with him or her. Knowing that such a person is warped and sinful, he is self-condemned. That's kind of strong. Yeah, I can do it and you can do it. We should not put up with this stuff in our family or in, if you're a business owner, don't allow this in your, with your employees or vice versa. And whatever you're over, and your family, we've got to stop this from happening. Then Peter came up to him and said, I love this. And by the way, we're going back to this whole thing about, uh, we just talked about the ways to correct someone. Go to your brother first, take two or three, tell to the church, right? We're, we're done with that expose by Jesus. Now the apostle Peter's feeling pretty good about himself, you know, shining his ring. He said, then Peter came up to him and said, hey, Lord, how often my brother sin against me? In biblical literature, about three times was, was like it. Okay, one strike, two strikes, three strikes, you're out in the all ball game. That's how it was in the, in the Jewish uh, law. So, brother, it sins against me, and I forgive him as much as seven times. He's feeling pretty good about himself. Like, wow, I've, I've done everything. You told me the whole thing about how to go to my brother and how to make things right with my brother. Now I'm going to tell you, how often should I forgive? Seven times. And what does Jesus say? I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times seven. This is what, I, which is, seven's a perfect number. Never stop forgiving. Now, forgiving does not mean what you're saying, what the person did is correct. It just means you take the toxicity out of it. It means you take the venom out of it. You know, I, I don't have time to break this out part for any further, but scientific evidence, but the Bible said it millennia ago, now in quotes and behaviors will tell you that unforgiveness does bad for your body. It literally can cause you to be sick. It can lower your immune system. And all of a sudden, these radical cells in your body begin to have a field day because you're not strong enough to fight against them and you can get cancer. And it also invites a demonic realm as well. And it can make you crazy. A lot of people are sick today. A lot of people are not the only reason why. Because of this. I do not say to you seven times seven, but 70 times seven. Now, Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, I'm going to show you how important this is. I was just reading the other day in Scripture about, hey, can you say this mountain, be uprooted and thrown to the sea. I'm like, praise God. I'm reading this wonderful passage of Scripture about prayer. And now I continue to read on. This is the other day through the year in the Bible. 
I listen, I, did I tell you how much I like uh, reading through the Bible in a year? I'm just trying to advertise a little bit because it's amazing. A lot of the stuff I bring to you, I get from that. I actually get stuff from the Bible. <laughs> That's amazing. I plagiarized the Bible. I just want to let you know. Okay. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. That's a nice thing that Jesus is saying. Praise God, right? Right? Okay, we just quote that, and we put it on our dashboard. Uh, what does the next verse say? And connected... Whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against, thank you, anyone, so that your Father will, who is in heaven may what? Your trespasses. So there's, there's two things going on here. If I don't forgive others, God's not going to hear my prayer. Right? Ask whatever you want in my name and I'll do it. Hey, but... Uh, and when you're standing praying, uh, do you have anything against somebody? You need to forgive them. This is, this is, this is tied to this verse. They're not, in, they're not separate entities. They're one and the same. They're connected together. So could it be a lot of our prayers are not answered, and God's not answered our prayers because we refuse to forgive somebody. Maybe you, forgive, you refuse to forgive a gym coach from 20 years ago or 15 months ago that said something to you that still re resonates in your head. Maybe an ex-spouse, maybe a child, maybe your father, maybe your mother, or somebody said something, and you said, that's unforgivable. I'll never forgive that person. And you're wondering why you're on anxiety medication. I'm not saying that's the only reason why, by the way. But you're wondering why you're all tied up. You're wondering why God doesn't answer any prayers. You go to church, you get nothing out of it. Could it be that you're quarantining God from you because you refuse to forgive? And whenever you stand praying, forgive. You have anything against anyone so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. Forgiveness does not mean what the person, what they did was correct. Forgiveness means you take the toxicity out of you. Not forgiving someone is like setting yourself on fire with gasoline and hoping the other person dies of smoke inhalation. That's how practical that is. So we have to forgive. Forgiveness is a choice, not an emotion. You and I have to forgive. Now, I say this all the time. You know, there's been people that have been uh, sexually molested. Oh, I gotta forgive them. No, report them to the police or report them to the police so they don't do something to somebody else. But forgive them. If you're being abused, we'll call the police, but forgive them. Does that make sense? You have to forgive or you won't be forgiven. What are the consequences? <laughs> do you wanna play around and spin the chamber of the gun? I don't. God, Jesus, what Jesus said, while you were yet sinners, Christ died for you. Well, I'll forgive him when she, then I, when he, then I. Imagine if Jesus did the same thing. Well, when they, I will. No, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We didn't come looking for him. He came looking for us. Uh, 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 yeah, you want another one? He's on the cross. And what does he say? Father, go get them what they belong. Get them, God. Get them. Sick them. What do you say? Forgive them, for they know not what they do. What's more powerful than any military conquest is the power of God's love in forgiveness. The whole crux of our entire faith is based upon, I'm going to ask the worship team to make their way up, please. And whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, so that you're, some of you know how to forgive your spouse. Let me just say something. If you're not forgiving your spouse, you're in sin. I'm just gonna say it. You're in sin. But I don't care what they did. You're in sin. You must forgive. You must forgive. I, I, I know you don't like it, but get, you, wanna, you wanna be free? What happens is this. When you forgive someone, you set the prisoner free, and you're the prisoner. Oh, let me say another thing that's important to you. I want you to listen closely, okay? You'll never have to forgive someone more than God forgave you. Let me say that again. You'll never have to forgive somebody more than God forgave you. If you don't forgive, God won't forgive. I, I, I could go on and on, but I'm not going to right now. You see, 
forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also, what? Must forgive. Love looks past their behavior to the pain in their lives. You know, often people act a certain way because of what has happened to them. I want to just go ahead and, and, and really nail this down today, okay? This is, this is not playing around. What about this mamby pamby Christianity? This is not mamby pamby Christianity. This is, God, this is serious stuff. We love him because he what? Because he first loved us. Hello? Not because we loved him first. If someone says, I love God, I lift my hands in church, I pray, I speak in tongues, I cast out devils and prophesy. If someone says, I love God, and what? He is a what? For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he's not seen? Okay, hence, if you don't love somebody else, you hate somebody else, you cannot love God. How can you say, the Bible is very clear about this. So, do you hate anybody? Or how about this one? Do you hate yourself? You think that's noble? It's not. It's not noble to hate yourself. I'm no good. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I'm not good. You're not good. But you're not supposed to hate yourself. You know why? Because God loves you. How dare you hate yourself? It's sin to hate yourself. And some of you are cutting yourself. Some of you are abusing yourself and starving yourself. Some of you are doing things to yourself destructively because you hate yourself and you think God hates you. God does not hate you. God loves you. I don't know what God you're worshiping. That's not the God Jesus said on the cross loves us. He does not hate us. It's not godly to hate yourself. You need to love yourself because God loves you. But you never can love yourself until you love God. And when you love God, you'll be able to love yourself and you'll be able to love other people. So the first step to everything is Jesus. Have you given your life to Christ? This is some serious stuff. This is not, this is not joke. This is, this is like life and death stuff. Have you given your life to Jesus? If you were to die right now, right now, you'd walk out of here, and God forbid it was like a mortar went off like it is in Ukraine, and you were to be blown up, how can you? Well, this, stuff, this is stuff going on. Could you meet Je- Would you feel confident to meet Jesus in heaven and say, I'm good? If you can't answer that question, I suggest you get right with God today. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes just for a moment. Maybe you used to walk with God and now you're not walking anymore. Maybe you never gave your life to Christ. Today is the day of salvation. And how many of you would say today, if I were to die, I'm not quite sure where I'd go, but I want to know. I see a quick show of hands. You want to know for sure. Anyone else? Okay, let's pray this prayer together in the Lord, in your heart. Lord Jesus, I believe you're the son of God. I believe you died on the cross and paid for all of my sins and rose again from the dead. Today, I step down from being in charge of my life. I declare my life is yours, not my own. I ask you to forgive me and set me free. From this point forward, I choose to follow you the best way I know how, in Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, we believe you became born again. In the front pocket of your, of your chair, there's a connection card. You can say, my decision today. I want to fill that out. Also, you, if you're online, you can get your text. You can text. Can I quote you on that? No. Can, you can text believe. Okay. You can text believe to 860-499. I don't know where the prompt is. 860-499-4888. Text believe to 860-499-4888. And we'll help you with the next steps. On Tuesday night, we have something called Fresh Start. We'd love to have you become a part of that. Helps you walk the path that God has for you. Okay, so I want to just conclude with this. There's four different ways you can give. This is part of the worship, by the way. This is all works. You can go to uh, 833-245-5608. You can text it. You can download a push pay app. You can also go to cornerstonecheshire.com and snail mail. There are boxes in the back. May the Lord bless you. You You guys could all stand, please. I want to say a benediction over you. Can you just lift your hands as an act of of, of receiving? Let me read this benediction over you. The Lord bless you and keep you. 
The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Walk in the grace and the peace of Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you guys.